Welcome to the sixth lecture in the Henry VII series. Today we are going to examine the question of how centralized was Henry VII's government. In the previous lecture, we examined the concept of personal monarchy and how Henry VII governed as a ruler. Following this lecture, you probably believe that Henry VII had a highly centralized government. However, this only paints half a picture. Today we will examine how Henry had to delegate power to others. This lecture will be split into four parts. In the first section, we will study the different layers of power within Henry's government. In the second section, we will examine the first offshoot, the Star Chamber. Then we will examine a more significant offshoot of the royal court, called the Council Learned. Finally, we will examine the role and relative significance of Parliament during Henry's reign. This circle shows the distribution of power in England. At the nucleus, is the king himself. During the late medieval age, people believed that a king's right to govern came directly from God. Therefore, the king was not accountable to any of his subjects for the decisions that he makes. It was also entirely up to the king and his whims to decide what constitutes treason. This could be an action, a spoken criticism, or even suggestion of the king's mortality as a human being. Some historians argue that Henry was a tyrant for backdating his reign and declaring all those who fought against him at Bosworth as traitors. However, as traitors, he had the right to execute key Yorkist noblemen, which is something he refrained from. Henry knew that as the first in his dynasty, he had to tread a fine line between being an assertive, authoritarian king and being a despot or tyrant. The inner circle would represent the king's closest advisers, key members of the royal council that we discussed in the previous lecture, such as John Morton and John de Vere. These men and their families could gain considerable wealth and prestige due to their positions at court. However their favour was entirely dependent on the king's satisfaction with their service. The next circle represents the offshoots from the royal council, additional courts of law that administered the king's justice. These were the star chamber and the council learned. Further out, we have parliament. The first English parliament was created in the early 13th century, following on from the signing of the Magna Carta in 1215. It essentially evolved out of the Great Council, which is a council of both lords and bishops used to advise the king. The most important role that parliament played during the Middle Ages was to grant tax to the king. However, it was not designed to govern the country, as it does today. The House of Lords was the most important house with 227 members. Less influential was the House of Commons, where MPs would sit. MPs were from the gentry and they each represented their constituencies, out in the regions. If we scale this diagram, you can see that most of the power lay with the king and his closest advisers, with some power going to those who run the offshoot courts. However, it was very important for the king to maintain a strong link between central and regional government by appointing a loyal magnet to govern each region. The MPs in the Commons also acted as the mouthpiece for their regions and many of the petitions discussed in Parliament related to local issues. In our next lecture, we will study regional government and their link to the Crown. Many of these were so far removed from central power in London that some had become semi-autonomous. The problem with this is that it could lead to bastard feudalism if an overmighty noble in that region decided to raise troops against the king. Let's now examine the importance of the Star Chamber and Council Learned under Henry VII. Henry created the Star Chamber using an Act of Parliament in 1487 which was a turbulent year for Henry as it was the year of the Lambert Simnel pretender threat and the Battle of Stoke. Therefore, it was likely created as a reaction to these events. 
The Star Chamber was so named because the sessions were held in a courtroom with gold stars and royal blue ceiling. It was a judicial court designed to hold traitors to account for rebelling against the crown. It was presided over by magnates from the Great Council and had the power to preside over high-profile cases. However, there are very few records that survive from the court for Henry VII's reign. This suggests that the Star Chamber was not continually used throughout his reign. It likely lapsed into disuse once it had served its purpose in 1487. Instead, Henry preferred to use financial measures to punish the nobility, and this explains the birth of the Council Learned. The Council Learned in the Law, or simply Council Learned for short, was created in the late 1490s by close advisor Reginald Bray. This was near the end of the Perkin Warbeck threat and after William Stanley betrayed Henry while in the role of Lord Chamberlain. It was designed to protect the king's prerogative rights and his feudal dues as king. This is called fiscal feudalism, where the king, as the overlord of all others, used his feudal rights to demand payment from his nobles. Originally, Reginald Bray created it as an office to help collect outstanding debts owed to the crown, in order to bolster Henry's financial security. However, it developed into something more sinister. After Bray's death in 1503, the Council Learned was run by a lawyer named Edmund Dudley and his deputy Richard Empson. They became a notorious duo. The focus of the Council Learned turned more to keeping the nobility in check. Bonds of good behavior were placed on the nobility with the threat of huge financial fines for misbehavior. Edmund Dudley was able to manipulate English law in order to extract as much money as possible from wealthy subjects. As a result, Dudley sold offices, wardships, and licenses to marry. He also issued pardons for treason, retaining, and other serious offences, always for a high price. For example in 1506 a lesser-known member of the nobility, called Lord Bergaveni, was given a huge fine after he was caught keeping a retainer of 471 men. The fine amounted to £70,650, which was an extortionate amount and so bankrupted the Lord. Dudley and Empson rose in prominence as the King's health deteriorated from 1507 onwards, replacing Reginald Bray and John Morton as Henry's chief ministers. However, as their power rose, they used ever bolder methods to extort money from the nobility. Historian Jasper Ridley describes how they seem to have been almost universally hated throughout England. They were accused of acting illegally when they extorted large sums of money from wealthy landowners, and of not only obtaining this money for the king, but of enriching themselves in the process. This rise to power was followed by a very sharp fall. On ascending the throne in 1509, Henry VIII was keen to ingratiate himself with the nobility and show his court that he was different to his father. As part of this, he had both Dudley and Empson executed for treason and he abolished the council learned. Under torture, they admitted to using illegal methods to extort the nobility. Whether this was true it is hard to know since very few official records from the council learned has survived. Finally, let's examine the role of Parliament. Some would argue that Parliament simply played the role of a tax-granting body during the late 15th century. However, this would be too simplistic, since it would overlook the way in which Henry used his first two Parliaments to pass laws that helped to consolidate his own position. The most significant of these were discussed in the second lecture, such as the Act of Attainder. However it is worth noting that even the creation of a new law court, such as the Star Chamber, had to be passed as an act through Parliament. Unlike today, the most important house in Parliament was the House of Lords, which constituted all the Lords temporal, in other words, the nobility and the Lords spiritual, in other words the prelates or bishops. Together, there were over 200 members of the Lords, who also formed the Great Council. It was traditional for the king to choose his closest advisers from the Great Council, 
which Henry did to a certain degree, for example in his appointment of John Morton, who was an experienced bishop. But Henry also broke from this tradition by appointing men without a title, such as Sir Reginald Bray, to prominent positions. This suggests a shift away from the late medieval model of kingship. The House of Commons played a more passive role in central government. The right to vote for your elected member of parliament was limited to just the gentry class. These representatives would use their position in parliament to bring petitions from their region and pass laws that had a very localized impact. The important pieces of legislation came directly from the king or his advisers, and was usually passed without opposition. This was certainly the case for the important legislation that was passed at the start of his reign. Parliament essentially became a tool of the king to bolster his legitimacy and to justify the measures he needed to put in place for the security of his dynasty. Let's now look at the notion that Parliament was little more than a tax-granting body. There is some credibility to this argument, since Henry did call Parliament on three occasions with the express purpose of raising taxes through Parliament, which were called subsidies. Firstly, in 1487, during the Simnel Pretender threat and ahead of the Battle of Stoke. Then again in 1488 following the Treaty of Redden in order to pay for a military force to defend Brittany's independence from France. And finally, in the mid-1490s, when faced with a potential Scottish invasion in support of the Pretender Perkin Warbeck. On all three occasions, the parliamentary subsidy was granted with no opposition from either the Commons or Lords. Therefore, it was a fairly straightforward way of raising extraordinary income in times of need. However, both the Yorkshire Rebellion in 1489 and the Cornish Rebellion in 1497 proved that opposition to tax among the populace was strong so this was not a reliable income stream. Instead, the focus shifted to the council learned and use of financial penalties against the nobility. As a result, Henry relied far less on Parliament in the latter half of his reign. In total, Henry called Parliament seven times throughout his reign, but five of those seven Parliaments were called from 1485 to 1495. This shows that Parliament was important as both a tax-granting body and a means of bolstering Henry's legitimacy. Let's return to our overarching question of how centralized was Henry VII's government. Let's first remember that Henry used a model of personal monarchy and took an active role in government. This meant that the royal court and especially the privy chamber were the most important aspects of government. However, Henry did use offshoots of the royal court to administer both finance and justice. In 1487 he created the Star Chamber to administer justice against those who had betrayed him at the Battle of Stoke. By the second half of his reign the Star Chamber had been abandoned and the Council Learned became the court used to manage over mighty nobles. Under Edmund Dudley and his deputy Richard Empson the Council Learned became infamous as a court of dubious legality that issued severe fines to misbehaving noblemen. Parliament was an important mechanism of government at the start of Henry's reign since he used it to pass significant pieces of legislation to consolidate his position on the throne. However by the latter half of the reign it was used as a tax-granting body and following the Cornish Rebellion, Henry saw that taxes were not a reliable form of crown revenue, so Parliament declined in importance. This also coincided with the increased use of the council learned to impose financial penalties on the nobles. Thank you for watching. Our next lecture will examine how Henry delegated the governance of the regions to trusted magnates and servants and how he tightened the links between central and local government through the use of justices of the peace.